Hello and welcome to the Street Crime UK YouTube channel. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Today we look at the Great Train Robbery of 1963. The members of the Great Train Robbery have placed themselves in the minds of the UK criminal underworld. The Great Train Robbery was a robbery of £2.6 million from a Royal Mail train heading from Glasgow to London on the West Coast Main Line in the early hours of the 8th of August 1963 at Brekido Railway Bridge, Ledburn near Mentmore in Buckinghamshire, England. After tampering with the line side signals to bring the train to a halt, a gang of 15, led by Bruce Reynolds, attacked the Royal Mail train. Other gang members included Gordon Goody, Buster Edwards, Charlie Wilson, Roy James, John Daly, Jimmy White, Ronnie Biggs, Tommy Wisby, Jim Hussey, Bob Welch, and Roger Cordry, as well as three men, known only as numbers one, two, and three two of whom later turned out to be Harry Smith and Danny Pembroke. A 16th man, an unnamed retired train driver, was also present at the time. With careful planning based on inside information from an individual known as the Ulster Man, named possibly erroneously as Patrick McKenna in 2014, the robbers escaped with over £2.6 million. The bulk of the stolen money has never been recovered to this day. Though the gang had not used any firearms, Jack Mills, the train driver, was beaten over the head which was later known as a metal bar. Mr Mills was so severely injured that Mr Mills never worked again. After the robbery, the gang went to hide at the Leatherslade farm. The police later found this hideout. Incriminating evidence led to the eventual arrest and conviction of most of the gang members. The ringleaders of the robbery went on to be sentenced to 30 years in jail. The plan to intercept and rob the overnight Glasgow to London Royal Mail train was based on information from an unnamed senior security officer within Royal Mail. The unnamed senior security officer had detailed knowledge of the amounts of money carried. The senior security officer who was introduced to two of the criminals who would carry out the raid, Gordon Goody and Buster Edwards, by a London solicitor's clerk, Brian Field. The raid was devised over a period of months by a core team. Gordon Goody and Ronald Buster Edwards along with Bruce Reynolds and Charlie Wilson. Bruce Reynolds assumed the role of the mastermind behind the train robbery, later being referred to as the Great Train Robbery of 1963. This gang, although very successful in the criminal underworld, had virtually next to no experience in stopping and robbing trains, so it was agreed to enlist the help of another London gang called the South Coast Raiders, who had the experience the gang needed to pull off the pre-planned train robbery. They enlisted South Coast Raiders, including Tommy Wisby, Bob Welch and Jim Hussey, who were already accomplished train robbers. The gang called the South Coast Raiders also included Roger Cordry, a man who was a specialist in the train robbery field and knew how to rig the trackside signals to stop the train. Other associates included Ronnie Biggs, a man Mr Reynolds had previously met in jail, who was added as the organisation evolved and took on more specialist members. The final combined gangs who took part in the raid comprised a total of 16 men. At 6.50pm on Wednesday the 7th of August 1963, the travelling post office train set off from Glasgow Central Station en route to Houston Station in London. The train was scheduled to arrive at Houston at 4am the following morning of Thursday the 7th of August 1963 and went on to be hauled by English Electric Type 4, which was later named Class 40 Diesel Electric Locomotive D326, which later became 4126. The train consisted of 12 carriages and carried 72 post office staff who sorted mail during the journey from Glasgow to London. All the mail was loaded onto the train at Glasgow during additional station stops en route to London and from line-side collection points where local post office staff would hang mail sacks on elevated trackside hooks that were caught by nets deployed by the onboard staff. All of the sort through mail on the train could be dropped off at the same time. This process of exchange allowed mail to be distributed locally without delaying the train with unnecessary stops to drop individual area mail off. One of the carriages involved in the robbery is preserved at the Nain Valley Railway in Peterborough, England. The second carriage, behind the engine, was known as the HVP High Value Packages Coach, which carried large quantities of money and registered mail for sorting by the Royal Mail staff on board. <laughs> 
1960, the Post Office Investigation Branch recommended the fitting of alarms to all TPOs with HVP train carriages. This recommendation from the Post Office's Investigation Branch was implemented in 1961, but the HVP train carriages without the alarms were retained in reserve until a later date. The fitting of radios were also considered but they were deemed to be too expensive at the time and the measure of fitting radios in the carriages was not implemented. This M30204M carriage was kept for evidence for seven years following the event and then burned at a scrapyard in Norfolk in the presence of police and post office officials to deter any souvenir hunters. Just after 3am on the 8th of August, the driver, 58 year old Jack Mills from Crewe, stopped the train on the West Coast Main Line at a red light signal at Sears Crossing Leadburn, between Leighton Buzzard and Cheddington. The signal had been tampered with by the robbers. They had covered the green light and connected a battery power to the red light. The locomotive's second crew member, known as the second man, was 20 year old David Whitby, also from Crewe. As the signal stop was unexpected at this time and place, Mr Whitby climbed down from the cab to call the signal man from a line side telephone only to find the cables had been cut. Meanwhile, gang members entered the engine cabin from both sides and as Mr Mills grappled with one robber, he was struck from behind by another with a cosh and rendered Mr Mills semi-conscious. The robbers now had to move the train to Bridigo Bridge, which is now known as Mentmore Bridge approximately half a mile further along the track where the gang had planned to unload the money. One of the robbers had spent three months befriending railway staff and to get accustomed to the layout and operation of the trains and carriages. Ultimately though, it was decided that it would be better if the gang used an experienced train driver to move the locomotive and the first two carriages from the signals to the bridge after uncoupling the Royal Mail carriages containing the rest of the sorters and the ordinary mail. On that night, the gang hired a new train driver, an acquaintance of Ronnie Biggs, later referred to as Stan Agate or Peter, was unable to operate this new type of locomotive. Although having driven older or different trains for many years, Mr Biggs was then retired and was experienced only in shunting locomotives on the southern region. With no alternatives available to the gang, it was quickly decided that Mr Mills would have to move the train to the stopping point near the bridge, which was indicated by a white sheet stretched between poles on the track at the time. Mr Biggs' only task was to supervise Mr Agate's participation in the robbery, and when it became obvious that Mr Agate was not able to drive the train, Mr Agate and Mr Biggs were sent to the waiting truck to help load the mailbags. The train was stopped at Bridigo Bridge and the robbers' assault force attacked the HVB Royal Mail carriages. Frank Dewhurst was in charge of three other postal workers, Leslie Penn, Joseph Ware and John O'Connor, in the HVP carriages. Thomas Kett, assistant inspector in charge of the train from Carlisle to Houston, was also in the carriage. Both Mr Dewhurst and Mr Kett were hit with coshes when they made a vain attempt to prevent the robbers storming the carriage knowing what was about to go down. Once the robbers had entered the carriage, the staff could put up no effective resistance and there was no police officer or security guard on board to assist the staff on the train. The staff was made to lie face down on the floor in a corner of the carriage. Mr Mills and Mr Whitby were then brought into the carriage, handcuffed together and put down beside the staff in the carriage. The robbers removed all but eight of the 128 sacks from the HVB carriage, which they transferred in about 15 to 20 minutes to the waiting truck by forming a human chain to pass down the 128 sacks. The gang then departed in their Austin Lodestar truck some 30 minutes after the robbery had begun, and to mislead any potential witnesses, they used two Land Rover vehicles, both of which bore the registration plates BMG 757A. The gang then headed along less popular roads, listening for police broadcasts on a VHF radio. The journey taking somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour and arrived back at the Leather Slade farm at around 4.30, at around the same time as the first reports of the crime were being made. Leather Slade farm was a rundown farm 27 miles from the crime scene, between Oakley 
and Brill, Buckinghamshire, England. It had been brought out two months earlier as their hideout. At the Lever Slade farm, they counted the proceeds of the 128 sacks and divided it into 16 full shares and several drinks, which meant smaller sums of money intended for associates of the gang. The precise amount of the split between all associates and the gang members differs according to the source, but the full shares came to approximately 150,000, each equivalent to 3.2 million pounds at today's valuation. From listening to their police tuned radio, the gang learned that the police had calculated they had gone to ground within a 30 mile radius of the crime scene, rather than dispersing with their haul at the scene. This declaration was based on the information given by a witness at the crime scene in the train carriage the gang had robbed, who had stated that a gang member who had told the post office workers not to move for at least half an hour. The press had interpreted this information as a 30 mile radius, a half hour drive in a fast car. The gang realised the police were using a dragnet tactic, and with help from the public, this would probably result in discovering the farm much sooner than the gang originally anticipated. A dragnet is a system of coordinated measures for apprehending criminals or suspects, including road, barricades, traffic stops, widespread DNA tests and general increased police awareness. As a result, the plan for leaving the farm was brought forward to Friday from the previous Sunday, when the crime was committed on the previous Thursday. The vehicles they had driven to Leather Slade Farm could no longer be used because they had been seen by the train staff. Brian Field came to the farm on the Thursday to pick up his share of the loot and to take Roy James to London to find an extra vehicle. Bruce Reynolds and John Daly picked up cars, one for Jimmy White and the other for Reynolds, Daly and Biggs and the replacement train driver. Mr. Field, his wife Karen and his associate Mark brought the vans and drove the remainder of the gang to the Fields' home to recover. Mr. Field had arranged with Mark to carry out a comprehensive cleanup and set fire to the farm after the robbers had left, even though the robbers had already spent much time wiping down to be free of any prints, and as a precaution, Mr. Field still went ahead and requested that Mark do a deeper clean and then set fire to the leather slade farm. According to Buster Edwards, Mr. Field nicked 10,000 in 10 shilling notes to help pay for Mark's drink. However, on Monday, when Charlie Wilson rang Brian Field to check whether the farm had been cleaned, he did not believe that Mr. Field's assurances that the Leverslade farm was in fact clean. Mr. Wilson called a meeting with Mr. Edwards, Mr. Reynolds, Mr. Daly and Mr. James as they agreed that they needed to be sure. The group then went on to call Mr. Field to a meeting on the following Tuesday where Mr. Field was forced to admit that he had failed to set fire and burn down the Leatherslade farm. In the IVS 2012 documentary film, The Great Train Robbery, Nick Reynolds, son of Bruce Reynolds said, the guy who was paid to basically go back to the farm and burn it down, did a runner. Mr. Wilson would have killed Mr. Field there and then, but was restrained by other gang members. By the time they were ready to go back to the Leather Slade farm, however, they learned that police had found the hideout already, so they would not go back without risking being found and arrested. There is uncertainty regarding the exact cash total stolen from the train robbery in 1963. 2.6 million is a figure quoted in the press. Although the police investigation states the theft as 2,595,997.10 shillings in 636 packages contained in 120 mail bags, the bulk of the haul in one pound and five pound notes, both of which were older white note and the newer blue note, which was half its size. There was also 10 shilling notes and Irish and Scottish money in the 120 mail bags. Because a 30 minute time limit had been set by Mr. Reynolds, eight of 128 bags were not stolen and were left behind by the gang. Statistically, this could have amounted to 131,000 or 4.7% of the total that was robbed from the Royal Mail train that day. It is alleged that the total weight of the bags removed was 2.5 tonnes, according to former Buckinghamshire police officer John Woolley. Famously, the gang had used the stolen cash as money in a game of Monopoly while held up at the Leather Slade farm, 
The robbers had cut all the telephone lines in the vicinity of the Royal Mail train, but one of the railmen left on the train at Sears Crossing caught a passing goods train in Cheddington, where he raised the alarm at around 4.20. The first reports of the robbery were broadcast on the VHF police radio, and within a few minutes, this is where the gang heard the line, a robbery has been committed and you'll never believe it. They've stolen the train. The gang consisted of 17 members who were to receive an equal share, including the men who were at the robbery and two key informants the gang had used to pull the robbery off. The gang that carried out the robbery consisted of 15 criminals, predominantly from South London. They were Gordon Goody, Charlie Wilson, Buster Edwards, Bruce Reynolds, Roy James, John Daly, Roger Cordry, Jimmy White, Bob Welch, Tommy Wisby, Jim Hussey, and Johnny Biggs, as well as Harry Smith and Danny Pembroke, who were never charged due to the lack of evidence against them, and one still unknown, plus the train driver they nicknamed Pop. The best known member of the gang, Mr Biggs, had only a minor role to recruit the train driver. Bruce Richard Reynolds was born on the 7th of September 1931 at Caring Cross Hospital, Strand, London, by Thomas Richard and Dorothy Margaret. Mr. Reynolds' mother died in 1935, and Mr. Reynolds had trouble living with his father, Thomas Richard, and his stepmother, so Mr. Reynolds often stayed with one or other of his grandmothers because Mr. Reynolds and his stepmother did not get along. Mr. Reynolds was jailed for three years on several counts of breaking and entering, and upon Mr. Reynolds' release, quickly started reoffending. Mr. Reynolds soon joined a gang with best friend John Daly, who would later become Mr. Reynolds' brother-in-law. They were mentioned by South West gang leaders Ernie Watts and Terry Hogan, aka Harry Booth. After the train robbery, Mr. Reynolds escaped to Mexico with his wife Angela and young son Nick Reynolds, who later became a member of the band Alabama 3, whose song Woke Up This Morning was the opening theme of The Sopranos, and lived lavishly with his share of the take, approximately £150,000, which was a lot of money back in the 1960s. When the money ran out, Mr. Reynolds moved his family to Canada and then France under false identities in search for work before returning to the United Kingdom to pursue opportunities promised by Mr. Reynolds' old criminal contacts. Mr. Reynolds was later arrested in 1968 in Torquoy and sentenced to 25 years in jail, but went on to be released a decade later due to good behaviour. Mr. Reynolds was then sent back to prison in the mid-1980s for dealing amphetamines. Mr. Reynolds has produced occasional journalism pieces, been a consultant on a movie and book projects about the train heist, and published a well-regarded crime memoir, Crossing the Line, the autobiography of a thief, 1995. In a 2003 interview, Mr. Reynolds recalled, from an early age, I always wanted a life of adventure, which subsequently led him to a life of crime. Mr. Reynolds was rejected by the Royal Navy because of poor eyesight, and then tried to become a foreign correspondent, but Mr. Reynolds' high achievement in that vein was to become a clerk at the Daily Mail. While Mr. Reynolds' life in crime did provide excitement, Mr. Reynolds said in 2003, I've always felt that I can escape my past, and in many ways, I feel that it is more like a line from the ancient Mariner, and that notoriety was like an albatross around my neck. Mr. Reynolds died, aged 81, on the 28th of February 2013, after a brief illness. Authorities regarded Douglas Gordon Goody as the mastermind of the operation to the robbery of the Royal Mail train. Mr. Goody first made contact with the Ulster Man in a meeting set up by Brian Field in Finsbury Park. Of Northern Irish descent, Mr. Goody was born in Putney, London in March 1930 and was still living in his mother's flat at the time of the train robbery. In the early 1960s, he joined Buster Edwards' gang and helped rob various easy targets. After Mr. Goody's release from prison in 1975, Mr. Goody moved to the whitewashed town of Mallorca in Almira, Spain, where Mr. Goody ran a tiki beachfront bar. In September 2014, Mr. Goody claimed the identity of the Ulster man was Patrick McKenna for the first time in a documentary marking the 50th anniversary of the train robbery. The documentary makers employed Ariel Bruce, 
a social worker who finds missing family members, to trace Patrick McKenna who was found to have died some years previously. However, Ariel Bruce was successful in his attempts to make contact with Mr McKenna's family. This documentary was shown in cinemas and on demand in October 2014. On the 29th of January 2016, Goody died of emphysema at the age of 85. The most dangerous of the great train robbers was the silent man, Charlie Wilson. Mr. Wilson was born on the 30th of June 1932 by Bill and Mabel Wilson in Battersea. Mr. Wilson had friends from childhood, Jim Hussey, Tommy Wisby, Bruce Reynolds and Gordon Goody. Later on, Mr. Wilson sent to meet Ronald Edwards and the young driving enthusiast Mickey Ball and Roy James who were taking up car theft. From 1948 to 1950, Mr. Wilson was called up for national service, but in 1955, Mr. Wilson married Patricia Osborne and went on to have three children. While Mr. Wilson did have legitimate work in his in-laws' grocery shop, Mr. Wilson also was a thief and his criminal proceeds went into buying shares in various gambling enterprises. Mr. Wilson went to jail for short spells for numerous offences through his younger years. In 1960, Mr. Wilson began to work with Bruce Reynolds and planned to get into what he thought to be the criminal big league. Ronald Christopher Edwards was born on the 27th of January 1932 at Lambeth, London, the son of a regular barman. After leaving school, Mr. Edwards worked hard in a sausage factory where Buster began his criminal career by stealing meat to sell on the post-war black market. During Mr. Edwards' national service in the RAF, Mr. Edwards was detained for stealing cigarettes. When Mr. Edwards returned to South London, Buster ran a drinking club and became a professional criminal. Ronald Buster Edwards went on to get married to June Rose in 1952. Together, Mr. Edwards and Miss Rose had a daughter, Nikki. In Mr. Edwards' final years, he ran a flower store outside Waterloo Station in London. Brian Arthur Field was born on the 15th of December 1934 and was immediately put up for adoption by his parents. Mr. Field served two years in the Royal Army Service Corps, seeing service during the Korean War. Although soldiers in the service corps were considered combat personnel, they were primarily associated with the transport and logistics of the operations. When Mr. Field was discharged from the military, it was with the leaving his superiors with the express feelings that Mr. Fields was a very good character. Mr. Fields later became a solicitor's managing clerk for John Wheater & Co. Although Brian Fields was only 28 at the time of the robbery, Mr. Field was already apparently more preposterous than his boss, John Wheater, as was Mr. Field's nature. Mr. Field drove a new Jaguar and had a nice house, Cadbury, an amalgamum of Karen and Brian Field, with Brian Field's wife at the Brittle Bridge, Witch Church Hill, Oxfordshire, while his boss owned a battered Ford and lived in a rundown neighbourhood. Part of the reason for Mr. Field's prosperity was that he was not averse to giving Mr. Goody or Mr. Edwards information about Mr. Field's clients and had in their country houses making them prime targets for thieves. On one occasion, Mr. Field described the contents and layout of a house near Weybridge where Mr. Field's wife Karen had once been a nanny. Prior to the robbery, Mr. Field had represented Buster Edwards and Gordon Goody in past criminal convictions. Mr. Field had arranged Mr. Edwards' defence when he had been caught with a stolen car and had met Mr. Goody at a nightclub in Soho. Mr. Field was called upon to assist in Mr. Goody's defence in the aftermath of the airport job, which was a robbery carried out on the 27th of November 1962 at the BOAC Comet House, Hatton Cross, London Airport. This was the big practice robbery that the South West Gang had done prior to the later known train robbery as the Great Train Robbery of 1963. Mr. Field was also successful in arranging bail for Mr. Goody and Mr. Wilson at other times. 
In 2014, Douglas Goody had claimed to journalists that the Ulster man was Patrick McKenna and at the time of the robbery, a 43-year-old postal worker living in Salford, Lancashire. Patrick McKenna, who was originally from Belfast, met Mr Goody four times in 1963. Mr Goody alleged that he found out Mr McKenna's name only when he saw it written inside his spectacles case that Mr Goody had forgotten about. It is not known, not even to this day, what became of the shares Mr McKenna allegedly received, but Mr McKenna's children were flabbergasted on hearing the claim of their father's involvement in the Great Train robbery. It was surmised that Mr McKenna either donated his share to the Catholic Church over the years or had the money from his share stolen. This alleged identification of Mr McKenna as the Ulsterman has been disputed, not at least because Mr McKenna himself appears to have had no criminal record or associations and Mr McKenna himself died poor. It has been suggested that a known associate of the convicted robbers, Sammy Osterman, was part of the gang and his Osterman nickname was simply the result of mishearing of Mr Osterman's surname. William Gerald Ball, born the 22nd of October 1913 and died on the 26th of June 1970, an accomplice after the fact of Roger Cordry, was convicted as being one of the robbers despite playing a role no different from the many other accomplices of the various train robbers in the past. Mr Ball later died in jail. Leonard Dennisfield, born 1931, date of death is still unknown, helped with the purchase of the Leatherslade Farm hideout, paying the deposit of £5,000 in return for a drink of £12,000. Lenny Field was allowed to think that the plan was to hijack a lorry load of cigarettes. Despite not being in on the robbery, Leonard Field was convicted and sentenced to 25 years. 20 years for conspiracy to rob and 5 years for obstructing justice, which was later reduced to 5. Leonard Field was released from jail in 1967 and went to live in North London. John Denby Weeter, born on the 17th of December 1921, died on the 18th of July 1985, was the employer of Brian Field. Mr Weeter was convicted and sentenced to three years. He later died in Harrogate, near Leeds, aged 63. At 5am, 1963's Chief Superintendent Malcolm Futrell, head of the Buckinghamshire Police Criminal Investigation Department, located at Aylesbury, arrived at the crime scene, where Mr Futrell supervised evidence gathering. Mr Futrell then went to Cheddington Railway Station, where the train had been taken, and where statements were taken from the driver and postal workers. A member of the gang had told the postal staff not to move for at least half an hour, and this suggested to the police that their hideout could be within approximately a 30 mile radius from the scene. It appeared from interviews with the witnesses that about 15 hooded men dressed in blue boiler suits had been involved, but little more could be gleaned. By lunchtime of the following day, it became obvious to Mr Futrell that extra resources were needed to cope with the scale of the investigation, and the Buckinghamshire Chief Constable referred to the case to Scotland Yard. George Hatherill, commander of the C Department and Detective Chief Superintendent Ernest, Ernie Millen, head of the flying squad were initially in charge of the London side of the investigation into the train robbery. They sent Detective Superintendent Gerald MacArthur and Detective Sergeant John Pritchard to assist the Buckinghamshire Police. Police then undertook a major search, fanning out from the crime scene after having failed to find any forensic evidence on the remaining train carriages. A watch was put on the seaports. The Postmaster General, Reginald Bevins, offered a £10,000 reward to the first person who can give information leading to the apprehension and conviction of the persons responsible for the train robbery. Following a tip-off from a herdsman who used an adjacent field to the Leatherslade farm, a police sergeant and constable called there on the 13th of August 1963, five days after the train robbery had taken place. The Leatherslade farm was deserted but they found the truck used by the gang of the robbers, which had been hastily painted yellow, as well as the Land Rovers. The police also found a large quantity of food, 
bedding, sleeping bags, post office sacks, registered mail packages, banknote wrappers, and a Monopoly board game that the gang had used while at the Leverslade farm. It was determined that although the farm had been cleaned for fingerprints, some finger and palm prints presumed to be from the robbers had been overlooked. Including those on a ketchup bottle and on a Monopoly set which had been used after the robbery for a game, but with real money to pass the time and keep the robbers entertained. Despite the big breakthrough of the discovery of the Leather Slade farm, the investigation was not going as well as the police would have liked. The London side of the investigation then continued under Detective Chief Superintendent Tommy Butler, who replaced Detective Chief Superintendent Millen as head of the flying squad shortly after Mr. Millen was promoted to deputy commander under George Hathrill. On Monday the 12th of August 1963, Detective Chief Superintendent Tommy Butler was appointed to the head of the police investigation of London Connection and quickly formed a six-man train robbery squad. The Leverslade farm finally found on the 13th of August 1963 the day after Tommy Butler was appointed the head of the London investigation, the train robbery squad descended on the Leatherslade farm. The breakthrough came when Detective Chief Superintendent Millen met a distinguished barrister in a smoking room at an exclusive West End club who told Mr Millen that someone was willing to inform on the gang. The process of talking to the informer was handled by Mr Hathrell and Mr Millen and they never divulged the identity of the informer to the detectives in their command. The informant had been jailed in a provincial prison just before the train robbery and was hoping to get a parole and other favours from taking and providing information about the train robbery to the police. The informant also clearly did not know all the names perfectly and a second informant, a woman, was able to fill in the gaps. Mr Millen said in his book, Specialist in Crime, the breakthrough with the informer came at the moment when I and my colleagues at the yard were in a state of frustration, almost approaching despair. This process saw them get 18 names to be passed on to detectives to match up with the list being prepared from fingerprints collected from the Leather Slade farm, where the robbers had stayed temporarily after the robbery. Mr Hathrell and Mr Millen decided to publish photos of the wanted men despite strong protests from Tommy Butler and Frank Williams. This resulted in most of the robbers going to ground. Tommy Butler was a shrewd choice to take over the flying squad and in particular the trained robbery squad. Mr Butler became arguably the most renowned head of the flying squad in its entire history. Mr Butler was known variously as Mr Flying Squad, as One Day Tommy for the speed which he apprehended criminals and as the Grey Fox for his shrewdness. Mr Butler was also Scotland Yard's most formidable thief taker and as an unmarried man who still lived with his mother, Mr Butler had a fanatical dedication to his job. Mr Butler worked long hours and expected all members of the squad to do the same. The flying squad later had to work out rotations whereby one member would go home to rest, otherwise they were getting only three hours of sleep per night and had no time to eat healthily or see their families. When the squad tried to get Mr Butler to ease the working conditions, Mr Butler was enraged and threatened to send them back to their normal duties if they could not handle his expectations for them. Mr Butler was said to be very secretive with Jack Slipper claiming in his book Slipper of the Yard 1981 that Mr Butler wouldn't even tell his own left hand what the right was doing. This meant that the train robbery squad members were often dispatched on errands with no knowledge of how their tasks fit into the overall investigation. The six-man train robbery squad consisted of Detective Inspector Frank Williams, Detective Sergeant Steve Moore, Detective Sergeant Jack Slipper, Detective Sergeant Jim Neville, Detective Sergeant Lou Van Dyke and Detective Constable Tommy Thorborn. The senior officer, Frank Williams, was known to be quite the quiet man. Mr Williams' speciality was dealing with informants and he had the best working knowledge of the South London criminal fraternity in the force. One of the squad members, Jack Slipper, would later become head of the flying squad and would still be involved in the case many years later. 
the post office investigation branch had to establish the amount of money stolen, 2.5 million pounds and 10 shillings. The branch also sought to identify what money had been taken so that the relevant banks could be notified. Deficiencies in HVP carriage security were reported and secure carriages were immediately brought back into service. The installation of radios was recommended as a priority. The installation of radios was recommended as a priority. The investigation was detailed in a report by Assistant Controller Richard Yates that was issued in May 1964. The first gang member to be caught was Roger Cordry. Mr. Cordry was his friend, William Bolt, who was helping him lie low in return for the payment of old debts Mr. Bell owed. They were living in a rented, fully furnished flat above a florist shop in Wimborne Road, Mordown, Bournemouth. The Bournemouth police were tipped off by Ethel Clark, who unfortunately, Mr. Ball and Mr. Cordry was the widow of a former police officer. When Mr. Ball and Mr. Cordry paid rent for a garage in Tweedle Road, off Castle Lane West, three months in advance, all in used 10 shilling notes. Mr. Ball was not involved in the robbery, but was sentenced to 24 years and later died in prison in the 1970s. The police later acknowledged that Mr. Ball was the victim of a miscarriage of justice. Other arrests followed. Eight of the gang members and several associates were caught. The other arrests were made by Sergeant Stan Davis and probationary constable Gordon Charlie Case. On Friday the 16th of August 1963, two people had decided to take the morning stroll in Dorking Woods, discovered a briefcase, a holdall and a camel bag all containing money. They called the police who also discovered another briefcase full of money in the woods. In total, a sum of £100,000 was found. They also found a camel skin bag with a receipt inside from the cafe pension restaurant Sonnenbischel Hindenland, Prov, Germany. It was made out to her and Frey Field. Surrey police delivered the money and the receipt to Mr. Futrell and Mr. MacArthur in Aylesbury, who both knew by then that Mr. Brian Field was a clerk at Mr. James and Mr. Wheater, who had acted on the purchase of the Leather Slade farm. They quickly confirmed through Interpol that Brian and Karen Fields had stayed at the pension Sonnenbischel in the February of that same year. The police knew that Mr. Field had acted for Gordon Goody and other known criminals. Several weeks later, the police went to Mr. Field's house to interview him. Mr. Field calmly, for someone whose relatives had dumped a large part of the loot provided, a cover story that implicated Lenny Field as the purchaser of the Lever Slade farm and his boss, John Weeter, as the lawyer. Brian Field admitted to visiting the Leather Slade farm on one occasion with Lenny Field, but said Lenny assumed it was an investment of his brother Alexander Field, whom Brian Field had defended unsuccessfully in a more recent crime case. Brian Field, not knowing the police had found a receipt, readily confirmed that he and his wife had been to Germany on a holiday and gave them details at the place at which they stayed. On the 15th of September 1963, Brian Field was arrested and his boss John Wheater was arrested two days later. Brian's brother Lenny Field had already been arrested on the 14th of September 1963. Jack Slipper was the primary of one involved in the capture of Roy James, Johnny Biggs, Jim Hussey and John Daly. The trial of the robbers began at Aylesbury as Eyes, Buckinghamshire on the 20th of January 1964. Because it would be necessary to accommodate a large number of lawyers and journalists, the existing court was deemed too small and so the offices of Aylesbury Rural District Council were specially converted for the event. The defendants were brought to the court each day from Aylesbury Prison in a compartmentalised van out of view of the large crowd of spectators that would arrive and crowd of the surrounding areas for peaks of the gang members arrested. Mr Justice Edmund Davies presided over the trial which lasted 51 days and included 613 exhibits and a total of 240 witnesses. The jury retired to the Grange Youth Centre in Aylesbury to consider the evidence and come up to an agreed upon verdict. On the 11th of February 1964 there was a sensation when John Daly was found to have no case to answer. Mr Daly's counsel, Walter Rayborn QC, claimed that the evidence against his client was limited to his fingerprints being on the Monopoly set found at the Leather Slade farm 
and the fact that he went underground after the robbery. Walter Rayborn QC went on to say that Mr Daly had played the Monopoly game with his brother-in-law Bruce Reynolds early in 1963 and that Mr Daly had gone underground only because he was associated with people who were publicly sought by the police. This was not proof of involvement in a conspiracy however. The judge agreed and the jury was redirected to acquit Mr Daly of the charges against him. Detective Inspector Frank Williams was shocked when this occurred because, owing to Tommy's butler refusal to share information, Detective Inspector Frank Williams had no knowledge of the fact that Mr Daly's prints were on the Monopoly set. If Mr Williams had known this, he could have asked Mr Daly questions about the Monopoly set and robbed him of his very effective alibi. Mr Daly was clever in avoiding having a photo taken when he was arrested until he would want to shave his beard first. This meant that there were no photos to show the length of Mr Daly's facial hair had gotten before Mr Daly had the chance to change his bearded appearance. No action was taken against Mr Butler for his mistake in ensuring the case against Mr Daly was more thorough. On the 15th of April 1964, the proceeds ended with the judge describing the robbery as a crime of sordid violence inspired by vast greed and passing sentences of 30 years imprisonment on seven of the robbers. The 11 men sentenced all felt aggrieved at the sentences handed down on them, particularly Bill Bowl, who later died in prison, and Lenny Field who was later found not guilty of the charges against them. The other men, aside from Mr Wheater, resented what they had considered to be excessive length of the sentences, which were longer than any of those given to many murderers or armed robbers at that time. Train robbers who were sentenced later and by different judges received shorter terms than those of the Royal Mail train robbery. The severity of the sentences handed down to the robbers caused much surprise. When mastermind Bruce Reynolds was arrested in 1968, Mr Reynolds allegedly told arresting officer Tommy Butler that those sentences Mr Reynolds had received had detrimental effects. According to the arresting officer of the train robbers, Tommy Butler, gang leaders had prompted criminals generally to take guns with them when they were sent out on robberies. On the 13th of July 1964, the appeals by Lenny Field and Brian Field, no relation, had the charges of conspiracy to rob were allowed by the court. This resulted in their sentences being in effect reduced to only five years. On the 14th of July 1964, the appeals by Roger Cordry and Bill Ball were allowed, with the convictions for conspiracy to rob quashed, leaving only the receiving charges. Justice Fenton Atkinson concluded that a miscarriage of justice would result if Mr. Bowles' charges were upheld. Given that Mr. Bowles' age, physique and temperament made him an unlikely train robber. Luckily for Mr. Bowles, as the oldest robber, Mr. Corgi was also deemed to not be guilty of the conspiracy because his prints had not been found at the Leatherslade farm. Lenny Field was only reluctantly acquitted of the robbery by the judge. Justice Atkinson stated that he would not be surprised if Lenny Field were part of the conspiracy and one of the robbers. The charges against the other gang members were upheld. On the 12th of August 1964, Mr Wilson escaped from Winston Green Prison in Birmingham in under three minutes, the escape being considered unprecedented in that a three-man team had broken into the prison to extradite Mr Wilson out. Mr Wilson's escape team was never caught and the leader, nicknamed Frenchy, had disappeared from the London criminal scene by the late 1960s. Two weeks after Mr Wilson's escape, he was in Paris for plastic surgery. By November 1965, Mr Wilson was in Mexico City visiting old friends Bruce Reynolds and Buster Edwards. Mr Wilson's escape was yet another dramatic twist in the train robbery saga. 11 months after Mr Wilson's escape, in July 1965, Mr Biggs escaped from Wandsworth prison 15 months into his sentence. A furniture van was parked alongside the prison walls and a ladder was dropped over the 30 foot high wall into the prison during outside exercise time, allowing four prisoners to escape, including Mr Biggs. The escape was planned by recently released prisoner Paul Seaborn with the assistance of two other ex-convicts, Ronnie Leslie and Ronnie Black, with support from Mr Biggs' wife, Charmaine. The plot saw two other prisoners interfere with the warders and allow Mr Biggs and friend Eric Flower to escape beyond the prison walls. 
Paul Seaborn was later caught by Officer Butler and sentenced to four and a half years. Ronnie Leslie received three years for being the getaway driver. The two other prisoners who took advantage of Mr Biggs' escape were captured after just three months. Mr Biggs and Eric Flower paid a significant sum of money to be smuggled to Paris for plastic surgery, thus to prevent being captured. Mr Biggs said he had to escape because of the length of the sentence and what he alleged to be the severity of the prison conditions. Jimmy White with the other robbers on the run and having fled to the country, only Mr White was at large in the United Kingdom. Mr White was a renowned locksmith and thief and had already been on the run for 10 years before the train robbery had taken place. Mr White was said to have a remarkable ability to be invisible, to merge with his surroundings and become the ultimate Mr Nobody. Mr White was also a wartime paratrooper and a veteran of Arnhem. According to Piers Paul Reed in his 1978 book, The Train Robbers, Mr White was a solidarity thief not known to work with either firm. Mr White should have a good chance of remaining undetected altogether. Yet was known to be one of the train robbers almost straight away, first by other criminals and then by police. Mr White was unfortunate in that Brian Fields' relatives had dumped luggage containing £100,000 only a mile from the site where Mr White had brought a caravan and hidden an additional £30,000 in a panelling of that caravan. In addition, a group of men purporting to be from the flying squad broke into Mr White's flat and took a briefcase containing £8,500. Throughout Mr White's three years on the run with his wife Cherie and baby son Stefan, he was taken advantage of or let down by friends and associates quite often. On April 10th, 1996, a new friend recognised Mr White from photos in a newspaper and informed the police. They went on to arrest Mr White at Littlestone while he was at home. Mr White was found to have £8,000 to hand back to the police. The rest was gone. Mr White was tried in June 1966 at Leicester's Aziz's and Mr Justice Neild sentenced him to 18 years in jail considerably less than the 30 years given to the other principal offenders at the time. Buster Edwards Mr Edwards fled to Mexico with his family to join Bruce Reynolds and later Charlie Wilson but returned voluntarily to England in 1966 where Mr Edwards was sentenced to 15 years in jail. Charlie Wilson Mr Wilson took up residence outside Montreal, Quebec, Canada on Rigurud Mountain in an upper middle class neighbourhood where the large, secluded properties are surrounded by trees. Mr Wilson lived under the presumed name of Ronald Alloy, a name borrowed from a Fulham shopkeeper. Mr Wilson's wife and three children soon joined him in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Mr Wilson joined an exclusive golf club and participated in activities of the local community. It was only when Mr White invited his brother-in-law over from the UK for Christmas that Scotland Yard was able to track him down and recapture Mr White on outstanding warrants. Scotland Yard waited three months before making their move, in the hope that Mr Wilson would lead them to Mr Reynolds, the last suspect to be apprehended. Mr Wilson was arrested on the 25th of January 1968 by Tommy Butler. Many in Rigulad pensioned that Mr White's wife and three daughters be allowed to stay in the Montreal area of Canada. Bruce Reynolds On the 6th of June 1964, Mr Reynolds arrived in Mexico with his wife Angela and son Nick, joining Mr Reynolds a few months later after they evaded the obvious police surveillance. A year later, in July 1965, Buster Edwards and his family arrived, although unlike Mr Reynolds' family, they planned to return to England at some stage and did not like living in Mexico. Charlie Wilson, on the run with his family, still back in England, visited them for six weeks so three of the train robbers were together in exile for a short period of time. After the Edwards family returned to England, the Reynoldses also decided to leave Mexico and go to Canada to potentially join up with the Wilson family, leaving on the 6th of December 1966. The robbers had spent much of their share of the robbery by this point, living far more extravagantly than the Edwardses had. After realising the danger in settling near the Wilson family in Montreal, they went to live in Vancouver and then went to Nice, France. Mr Reynolds did not want to go to Australia where Mr Biggs was and needed money, decided to go back to England, settled briefly in Torquay before being captured by Tommy Butler. 
Ronnie Biggs. Ronnie Biggs fled to Paris, where he acquired new identity papers and underwent plastic surgery. In 1970, Ronnie Biggs had moved to Adelaide, Australia, where he worked as a builder and Ronnie and his wife had a third son. Tipped off that Interpol was showing interest, Ronnie Biggs moved to Melbourne, working as a set constructor for Channel 9, later escaping to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, as the police have discovered Ronnie Biggs' Melbourne address. Ronnie Biggs could not be extradited because there was no extradition treaty between Britain and Brazil at the time, and additionally, Ronnie Biggs became father to a Brazilian son, which afforded him legal immunity. As a result, Ronnie Biggs lived openly in Rio for many years, safe from the British authorities that were out to catch and send him to jail for his outstanding warrant for robbery. In May 2001, aged 71, and having suffered three strokes, Ronnie Biggs voluntarily returned to England. Accepting that he could be arrested, Ronnie stated desire to walk into a Margate pub as an Englishman and buy a pint of bitter, despite being wanted by police. Arrested on landing after detention and a short court hearing, Ronnie Biggs was sent back to prison to serve the remainder of his sentence. On the 2nd of July 2009, Ronnie Biggs was denied parole by Justice Secretary Jack Straw, who considered Ronnie Biggs to be still woefully unrepentant but was released from custody on the 6th of August, two days before his 80th birthday on compassionate grounds. Ronnie Biggs later died on the 18th of December 2013, aged 84. Following the deaths of Mr. Goody on the 29th of January 2016 and Tommy Wisby on the 30th of December 2016, Bob Welsh is the only remaining known member of the gang known to still be alive by this time. In later years, the robbers generally came together only for the funerals of their fellow gang members to pay their respects. Mr. Wilson's funeral on the 10th of May 1990 was attended by Bruce Reynolds, who reported seeing Buster Edwards, Roy James, who got into a verbal argument with the press, Mr. Welsh, who was hobbling on crutches, and Mr. White, who went unnoticed due to his natural ability to blend into the background. At Mr. Edwards' funeral in 1994, Mr. Reynolds claimed to see Mr. Welsh. Mr. Hussey, Mr. Wisby, and Mr. James were in prison at this time. After being sentenced on the 16th of April 1964, Brian Fields served four years of his five-year sentence. Brian Fields was later released in 1967. While Brian Fields was in prison, his wife Karen divorced him and married a German journalist. Mr. Fields' wife Karen went on to write an article for the German magazine Stern. Karen confirmed that she took Roy James to Thame railway station so Mr. James could go to London and that Karen led a convoy of two vans back to her house, where the gang was joined by wives and girlfriends for a big party to celebrate the success of the crime they had committed. When Mr. Reynolds returned to the UK in 1968, Mr. Reynolds tried to contact Brian Field, as this was the only way he could get in touch with the Ulster man. It seems that Mr. Field was ambushed upon his release from prison by a recently released convict, Scotch Jack Buggy who presumably roughed up or even tortured Brian Field with a view to extorting some of the loot from the robbery for his own greed. Subsequently, Brian Field went to ground and Mr. Buggy was killed shortly after. Mr. Reynolds later gave up trying to find Brian Field. In the mid to late 1970s, Brian and Sian worked for the Children's Book Centre, which has been sold on the Kensington High Street, London. Mr. Field and his wife Sian were responsible for the company's operations in Central and Southern Europe to where they shipped English language books and held book fairs at international English schools. Brian Field, aged 44, and Sian, aged 28, died in a car crash on the M4 motorway on the 27th of April 1979, a year after the last of the robbers had completed their sentences. This accident occurred as the couple returned from a visit to Sian's parents in Wales. A Mercedes is driven by Amber Bisson, the pregnant 28-year-old daughter of well-known hairdresser Raymond Bisson, and nicknamed Mr. Teasy Weezy, crossed as a damaged section of the guardrail and slammed into the Brian Fields oncoming Porsche. The Fields, Amber, and her husband and two children were all killed instantly. It was several weeks after the accident that Mr. Fields' true identity was discovered by the police. 
It is not clear whether his wife Sian ever knew of Brian's past. The last of the robbers released, after serving about one third of his sentence, Mr. Wilson returned to the life of crime and was found shot dead at his villa in Marbella, Spain on the 24th of April 1990. Mr. Wilson's murder was thought to be related to suspected cheating in the drug dealing game. Mr. Wilson is buried in Steatham Cemetery. Buster Edwards, after he was released, Buster became a flower seller outside Waterloo Station in London. Mr. Edwards' story was dramatised in the 1988 film Buster, with Phil Collins in the title role. Mr. Edwards died in a garage in November 1994, allegedly committing suicide by hanging himself. Mr. Edwards' family continued to run the flower stall after his death. Roy James went back to the motor racing following his release on the 15th of August 1975. However, Mr. James crashed several cars and his chances of becoming a driver quickly faded into a past dream. After the failure of his sporting career, Mr. James returned to the trade as a silversmith. Mr. James produced a trophy given to Formula One promoters each year thanks to his acquaintance with the Formula One founder, Bernie Ecclestone. In 1982, Mr. James married a younger woman, but the marriage quickly broke down as the couple seemed incompatible with each other. By 1983, Mr. James and Charlie Wilson had become involved in an attempt to import gold without paying the excise duty. Mr. James was acquitted in January 1984 for his part in the swindle. In 1993, Mr. James shot and wounded his father-in-law, pistol whipping and partially strangling his ex-wife after they had returned their children for a day's outing. This resulted in Mr. James being sentenced to six years in jail. In 1996, James underwent triple bypass surgery and was subsequently released from prison in 1997, only to die almost immediately afterwards on the 21st of August after suffering from another heart attack. Mr. James was the fifth member of the gang to die despite being the youngest. Roger Cordry was the first of the robbers to be released, but Mr. Cordry's share of the theft had almost entirely been recovered by the police. Mr. Cordry went back to being a florist at his sister's business upon his release. Mr. Cordry is now dead, and his son Tony had publicly acknowledged that his dad confirmed that Bill Bowl was innocent of any involvement in the robbery. Bruce Reynolds, the last of the robbers to be caught, was released from prison on the 6th of June 1978 after serving a prison term of 10 years. Mr. Reynolds, then aged 47, was helped by Gordon Goody to get back on his feet before Mr. Goody departed for Spain. By October 1978, day release ended and Mr. Reynolds had to report to a parole officer. Frank Monroe, one of the three robbers who was never caught, temporarily gave Mr. Reynolds a job but did not want to attract undue attention by employing Mr. Reynolds for too long. Mr. Reynolds later got back together with his wife Angela and son Nicholas. Mr. Reynolds was arrested in 1983 for drug dealing offences. Mr. Reynolds denied having any involvement in the robbery. Mr. Reynolds was released again in March 1985 and dedicated himself to helping his wife Angela recover from a mental breakdown. In 2001, Mr. Reynolds and his son Nicholas travelled with reporters from the Sun newspaper to take Mr. Big back to Britain. In 2010, Mr. Reynolds wrote the afterword of Signal Red, Robert Ryan's novel based on the robbery, and Mr. Reynolds would regularly comment on the robbery. Mr. Reynolds died in his sleep aged 81 on the 28th of February 2013. John Daly, upon his acquittal and release, and after finding his share of the loot stolen or destroyed, Mr. Daly gave up his life of crime and went straight, putting his past thoroughly behind him. Mr. Daly and his wife Barbara and their three children moved to Cornwall, where Mr. Daly worked as a street sweeper until the age of 70, known to locals as Gentleman John or John the Gent. Mr. Daly told no one about the robbery, as he was told he could face a retrial, 
Mr. Daly died six weeks later after his brother-in-law, Mr. Reynolds, had passed away. On the 6th of August 2009, Ronnie Biggs was granted release from prison on compassionate grounds due to a severe case of pneumonia and other ongoing health problems. In 2011, Mr. Biggs updated his autobiography, Odd Man Out, The Last Straw. Having suffered a series of strokes after Mr. Biggs' release and unable to speak for the previous three years, Mr. Biggs died at the Carlton Court Care Home in London on the 18th of December 2013. Tommy Wisby was luckier than most of the others in that his loot had been entrusted to his brothers and when Mr Wisby emerged he had a house in South London and had a few investments to keep himself going. During Mr Wisby's prison stint his daughter Lorraine had died in a brutal car accident. Mr Wisby took a while to learn how to live harmoniously with his wife Renee, his daughter Marilyn having moved out upon Mr Wisby's return. Shortly after Mr. Wisby's release, Mr. Wisby was imprisoned on remand over a swindle involving traveller's checks. The judge acknowledged the minor nature of Mr. Wisby's role. Jim Hussey was released on the 17th of November 1975 and married girlfriend Jill, whom he had just met before the train robbery. Mr. Hussey's share of the loot had been entrusted to a friend of Frank Monroe, who squandered it despite Mr. Monroe periodically checking on its keeper. Mr. Wisby and Mr. Hussey fell back into crime and were jailed in 1989 for cocaine dealing, with Mr. Wisby sentenced to 10 years and Mr. Hussey to 7 years. In Mrs. Wisby's book, Gangster's Mole, Marilyn Wisby recounts that on the 8th of June 1988, after returning home from a visit to an abortion clinic and resting, they were raided by the drug squad. The raid uncovered one kilogram of cocaine and Rennie and Marilyn Wisby was arrested along with Jimmy Hussey who had been spotting accepting a package from Mr. Wisby in a park. Mr. Wisby himself was captured a year later in Wilmslow, Cheshire. Mr. Wisby was allegedly staying with another woman to the shock of his wife and daughter. In return for Mr. Hussey and Mr. Wisby's pleading guilty, the two women were unconditionally freed from their husband's grips. Upon their release from prison, both men retired from working. Mr. Wisby later explained, we were against drugs all our lives, but as years went on, towards the end of the 70s, it became more and more of the in thing to do. Being involved in a great train robbery, our name was good. Other criminals knew we had never grasped anyone. We had done our time without putting anyone else in the frame. On the 26th of July 1989, two men pleaded guilty and admitted at Snaresbrook Crown Court, London, that they were a part of a £500,000 cocaine trafficking ring. Mr. Wisby's grandson has also had trouble with law in Cyprus. Bob Welsh, born March 1929, was released on the 14th of June 1976. Mr. Welsh was the last of those convicted in the Aylesbury to be released from prison. Mr. Welsh later moved back in with his wife June and his son. He threatened the man left in charge of his shares of the theft to retrieve the remaining shares. A leg injury sustained in prison forced Mr. Welsh to undergo several operations, which left him disabled. Douglas Goody was released from prison on the 23rd of December 1975, aged 46, and went to live with his ill mother in her small cottage in Putney. Unlike other robbers, Mr. Goody was exceptionally lucky in that the man he left in charge of his affairs was loyal and successful, so Mr. Goody was able to live a relatively well-off lifestyle after leaving prison. In his final years of incarceration, Mr. Goody had taken full benefit of the newly established Education College at Wormwood Scrubs and studied Spanish to GCSE standard. Mr. Goody later moved to Mallorca, southern Spain, where he bought a property and a bar and settled down believing to be safer to be out of the United Kingdom entirely. Mr. Goody was at one point accused of cannabis smuggling, but ultimately cleared of all those wild charges. Mr. Goody continued to live in Mallorca until his death on the 29th of January, 2016. Following an illness he inevitably could not beat. <laughs> 
While there has been a lot of mystery surrounding several of the gang who were not imprisoned, in reality, the police knew almost the entire gang almost instantly, despite what the public or the news was saying. By the 29th of August 1963, Commander Hathrow had 14 names and told the police that Brian Field had tried to enlist another gang to rob the train, who had turned Mr. Field down. Mr. Hathrow's list was unerringly accurate. All the major gang members who were later jailed were identified except for Ronnie Biggs. With the exception of the minor accomplices, Lenny Field, Bill Bowl, and the train driver, the list was complete. Although, of course, the Ulster man was not identified. In terms of the ones that got away, there were four others identified. Harry Smith, Danny Pembroke, a fair-haired man, 25 years old and well-spoken, who was not named, and a non-descriptive man who may have been Jimmy Collins. In 2019, Mr. Pembroke's son, also called Danny, confirmed that his father was present during the raid. Mr. Pembroke escaped detection as he always wore gloves, including at the hideout at the Leatherslade farm and went outside to the toilet rather than using the one inside of the house. The son stated that Mr. Pembroke, whose share of the loot was £150,000, died in 2015, aged 79. Both Piers Paul Reed and Bruce Reynolds refer to three robbers who got away as Bill Jennings, Alf Thomas and Frank Monroe. Piers Paul Reed refers to this man as Bill Jennings in The Train Robbers, while Bruce Reynolds adds the nickname Flossie. Ronnie Biggs refers to him as Mr. One, as do other accounts. According to Bruce Reynolds, Flossie had no previous convictions and stayed well out of contact with the group. A shady figure, nobody knew exactly where he lived or even what his real name was. All we knew that he was 100% and was sure to outlast the Hula Baloo, the last report of Flossie, or Mr. One, said that he was in a safe house, banged up with two gorgeous girls and enough champagne to sink a battleship. It is clear that while Mr. Reynolds claims to not have known his real name, Flossie was just a participant in the Great Train robbery. He was a core part of the gang and participated in the London airport robbery. This robbery was the audacious raid that Gordon Goody and Charlie Wilson were acquitted of. The raid consisted of Roy James and Mickey Ball, as the getaway drivers with six robbers, Bruce Reynolds, Buster Edwards, Gordon Goody, Charlie Wilson, and Flossie, and a sixth man who did not participate in the train robbery. In the end, the only one caught after the airport raid was Mickey Ball, who pleaded guilty to being a getaway driver when a witness mistook him for Flossie. And to avoid being blamed for the actual violence, Mr. Ball agreed to plead guilty as an accomplice and was in prison during the time of the great train robbery. Mr. Ball was found out to have been given £500 from the proceeds of the train robbery. Henry Thomas Harry Smith, born on the 20th of October 1930, is believed to be flossy, and unlike most other robbers, actually got to spend his share of the loot, buying 28 houses and also a hotel and drinking club in Portsmouth, England. Mr. Smith was the only man not ultimately arrested that was on both the Hathrow list and Tommy Butler's list of criminals to rob the Royal Mail train that day. Danny Pembroke was an ex-army man who was a South London taxi driver and a South Coast raider. At Leatherslade Farm, Mr. Pembroke was the most careful of the gang and nothing was ever found to associate him with the robbery, despite the police being satisfied that Mr. Pembroke was one of the gang and had searched his house in September 1963. However, afraid that Mr. Pembroke would be betrayed, he did a deal with Frank Williams and paid back a sum of £47,000. Following the robbery, Mr. Pembroke left for America for a couple of years, knowing he was set up for life and then returned to live quietly in Kent. Mr. Pembroke later died at age 79 from a heart attack, at home, in his sleep on the 28th of February 2015. Mr. Pembroke had five children and his son Danny Jr. admitted to his involvement in the Channel 4 documentary in August 2019. According to Bruce Reynolds, Frank Monroe, who was never caught, worked as a film stuntman for a while before starting a paper and scrap metal recycling business. The driver, of course, was not a member of the gang, as defined by receiving an equal share, more as just an accomplice. <laughs> 
Piers Paul Reed called the replacement train driver Stan Agate, and Stan was apparently the true nickname of the replacement driver. Mr. Reed, concerned that the robbers may have hurt him, went to see Ronnie Biggs in Brazil to get his details, although was dismissed to find that Ronnie Biggs did not know his last name and knew and cared very little about him. With the meagre details provided, Mr. Reed used a detective agency to track down the driver at a town 20 miles south of London and found that the train driver was still alive, although somewhat senile and being cared for by his dear wife. The wife admitted that she had burnt all the clothes that he had worn that night and had nervously waited for either the gang to murder him or the police to arrest him. Mr. Reed promised not to reveal their identities. Unlike the other three members of the gang who got away, Peter Fordham does make mention of the replacement driver but notes that he is said now to be dead. Perhaps the robbers who provided material for the book did not want the police looking for the replacement driver. As at the time of publishing in 1965, Mr. Reynolds, Mr. White and Mr. Edwards were still on the run. Ronnie Biggs, in his 1994 autobiography, Odd Man Out, said that Bruce Reynolds offered him a chance to join the gang if Mr. Biggs could find a train driver. Ronnie Biggs offers the train driver a £40,000 share of the profits, tells Mr. Reynolds, and gives his address to John Daly, who then proceeds to check this train driver out. It seems that while he was an older man, the train driver still had to apply for two weeks leave of absence from his job. According to Mr. Biggs, Peter was paid his £40,000 drink, although other accounts claim otherwise. Mr. Biggs states that Mary Manson drove Peter and John Daly home, while Mr. Reynolds drove Mr. Biggs home. John Wheater was released from prison on the 11th of February 1966 and managed his family's laundry business in Harrogate, North Yorkshire. Mr. Wheater later wrote two articles in the Sunday Telegraph, which published the first one on the 6th of March 1966. Mr. Wheater later died in July 1985. Lenny Field was released in 1967 and went to live in North London. Lenny Field disappeared from the public eye. Mary Manson, an associate of Bruce Reynolds and John Daly, was charged with receiving £820 from the robbery. Mary Manson was held for six weeks but was later released. Mary Manson took care of the wives and children of some of the robbers while they were on the run or in jail. Jack Mills had constant trauma headaches for the rest of his life before dying of leukemia in 1970. Mr. Mills' assailant, who was one of the three members of the gang that were never identified by others in the gang. However, in November 2002, Mr. Hussey made a deathbed confession that it was him. Although there were suspicions that this was a repayment of a debt to divert the attention from the real perpetrator. Frank Williams, at the time a detective inspector, claimed at least three men who were directly involved are still at liberty and enjoying their full share of the money stolen and the profits from the way they invested it, one of them being the man responsible for the attack on the train driver. Frank Williams said that the train driver's assailant was not some phantom figure lurking in the criminal underworld and that he traced him, identified him and took him to Scotland Yard where Tommy Butler, Mr. Williams, went on to question him. The train driver could not be charged because of lack of evidence. There were no fingerprints or identifying marks anywhere. None of those arrested informed on this person, although it was claimed that this person had completely disobeyed instructions and used violence during the robbery when told not to. David Whitby, born on the 24th of January 1937, died on the 6th of January 1972, was also from Crewe. Mr. Whitby was traumatised by his trackside assault and subsequently rough treatment and never ever recovered from his ordeal. David Whitby was 26 years old at the time of the robbery. He was able to resume his job as a second man but died from a heart attack on the 6th of January 1972 at the age of 34 in Crewe, Cheshire. Engineer William Gerald Bilbole, born the 22nd of October 1913, died on the 26th of June 1970, was an accomplice after the fact of Roger Cordry. Mr. Bowl was considered so at the time because he knew Mr. Cordry, 
and moreover was found in Cordry's car where a large stash of stolen money was hidden. Mr. Ball's family are now trying to have his name cleared, as they believe, based on evidence not used in the original trial, that Mr. Ball was at best an accomplice after the fact, with no knowledge of the robbery, and that it was likely that Mr. Cordry told him nothing about the provenance of the cash. Furthermore, both Ronnie Biggs and Gordon Goody, two surviving gang members at the time, gave sworn advocates asserting that Bill Ball was innocent. Both gang members stated that they believe Mr. Ball was stitched up by the police. The audacity and scale of the robbery was yet another controversy with which the conservative government of Harold Macmillan had to cope with. After his success in securing Mr. White and Mr. Edwards, Tommy Butler got the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Joseph Simpson, to suspend Mr. McMillan's retirement on his 55th birthday so he could continue to hunt the robbers. It paid off with the arrest of first Mr. Wilson and then Mr. Reynolds. When asked by a reporter after the sentencing of Mr. Reynolds whether that was the end of it, Mr. Butler replied that it was not over until Mr. Biggs was caught. In 1969, Mr. McMillan was finally forced to accept compulsory retirement and later died in 1970, aged 57. The same day, Mr. Biggs's memoirs were published in the Sun newspaper. Mr. Butler's deputy, Frank Williams, was passed over to be his replacement as the head of the flying squad because Mr. Frank Williams' deal with Mr. Edwards and his deal with another of the robbers who was never caught. Following this, Mr. Williams left the force to become head of security for the airline Qantas. Mr. Williams wrote his autobiography, No Fixed Address, which was published in 1973. Jack Slipper of the Metropolitan Police was promoted to Detective Chief Superintendent. Mr. Slipper became so involved in the case that he continued to hunt many of the escaped robbers after he retired. Mr. Slipper believed that Mr. Biggs should not be released after returning to the United Kingdom in 2001 and after he appeared in the media to comment on any news item connected with the robbery before Mr. Biggs' death on the 24th of August 2005 at the age of 81. Detective Chief Superintendent Eastern Malcolm Futrell, head of the Buckinghamshire Crime Investigation Department, was born on the 29th of September 1909 and died on the 28th of November 2005, aged 96. Mr. Slipper retired on the last day of the trial after the verdicts were handed down and then compulsory retirement age of 55. This allowed Mr. Slipper with Ronald Payne of the Sunday Telegraph, who was involved in the paper's coverage of the case, to be the first of the investigators to write a book, The Train Robbers, on the robbery investigation of 1964. In the book, Mr. Slipper expressed some frustration with the flying squad, although he mostly had praise for most of the individual officers. Mr. Slipper's one regret was that he had the search for the hideout carried out radiating outwards from the scene of the robbery rather than an inward search from a 30 mile perimeter. Mr. Slipper worked as an accommodation officer for Portsmouth Polytechnic before retiring to live by the sea near Swanage. Mr. Slipper continued to express disgust at any film that he felt glamorized the robbers. It has been said that Mr. Slipper bore a striking resemblance to John Thorpe who was the star of Inspector Morse, which, perhaps coincidentally, was a television series about a detective in the Thames Valley Police Force, the modern day successor to Buckinghamshire Constabulary. Mr. Futrell was assisted and later succeeded in the investigation by John Woolley, who served in the Buckinghamshire Constabulary from 1959 to 1984. George Hatherell, alive from 1898 to 1986, had his service extended by one year because of the need to complete the investigation of the Great Train Robbery. Mr. Hatherell visited Canada and the US as a lecturer on police matters. Mr. Hatherell died on the 17th of June 1986 at the age of 87. Gerald MacArthur died aged 70 on the 21st of July 1996. Mr. MacArthur was famous for breaking up the Richardson gang at a time when a significant number of London-based detectives were known to be corrupt. One of the post office carriages that were part of the remaining train but not involved in the actual robbery is preserved at the Neen Valley Railway Station at Peterborough, Cambridgeshire, and is being restored. <laughs> 
The actual carriage that was robbed, M30204M, was retained for seven years following the robbery and then taken to Norfolk and burned in the presence of police and post office representatives at a scrapyard near Norwich in the 1970s. This was to deter souvenir hunters. Locomotive English Electric Type 4, D326, later known as 40126, was involved in a number of serious operating incidents. The locomotive was scrapped at Doncaster Railway Workshops in 1984. The retrieved Monopoly board used by the robbers at the Leatherslade Farm hideout and a genuine £5 note from the robbery are on display at the Thames Valley Police Museum in Sullumstead, Berkshire. For some years, Network Railway described the location of the robbery as Train Robbers Bridge in their infrastructure records and a structure identification plate showing this was attached to the bridge itself. This led to an outcry advocating the restoration of the original name of the Bridigo Bridge. In late 2013, Network Rail bowed to public pressure, but this time naming it Mentmore Bridge. The sign was replaced around 2017. £2.6 million was stolen, although the police report states that it was £2.59 million. The bulk of the haul was in £1 notes, £5 notes, both the older white note and newer blue note, which was half its size. The £5 notes were bundled in batches of £2,500, the £1 notes in batches of £500. There were also 10 shilling notes in batches of £250. A quantity of Irish and Scottish money was also stolen. With the exception of a few drinks for associates, the loot was split into 17 equal shares of around £150,000 each. However, George Hathrell claims that there were 18 shares. With a few notable exceptions, the money was quickly laundered or divided by friends, family and associates of the robbers. Much was laundered through the bookmakers. Mr Wilson and Mr Wisby were themselves bookmakers although, Astonishingly, only a few hundred pounds were identifiable by serial numbers, so the robbers could have spent the money without fear of being traced as a result of those serial numbers. There were 1,579 notes whose serial numbers were known and the rest of the money was 100% completely untraceable. The £5 notes were two different types because in 1957 the British government had begun to replace the large white notes with smaller blue ones that came in the rotation later on. The final changeover had not been completed by the time of the train robbery. The white notes quickly became far more suspicious to use, making it harder for them to be spent. Although within six months of the robbery, ten of the robbers had been locked up awaiting trial and three others were wanted criminals on the run very little of the money had actually ever been recovered. This has led to speculation that there is a great deal of robbery loot still out there in the market today. In fact, the money was soon seized and spent by predatory gangsters and greedy associates, relatives and lawyers. Thus, the proceeds of the greatest cash robbery in British history were quickly used up, with few of the robbers receiving any real long-term benefit for their efforts. Less than £400,000 was eventually recovered by the police. Over half of this consisted of the shares of Roger Cordry, £141,000, and allegedly Brian Fields, £100,000. A further £36,000 was recovered from Jimmy White's caravan. Roy James was carrying £12,000 when he was captured. The final sum of money recovered was £47,245, that was astonishingly found in the telephone box in Greater Dover Street, Newington, South London. The £47,245 recovered from a telephone box included 57 notes whose serial numbers had been recorded by the bank in Scotland. This money was part of a deal struck with Frank Williams by Danny Pembroke. In The Train Robbers, Piers Paul Reed claimed that the police were feeling the pressure because although they had caught many of the robbers, they had failed to recover much of the money that was stolen. While no evidence had been found against Danny Pembroke, he was believed to have been one of the South Coast Raiders. Some of the identifiable banknotes had been traced back to Mr Pembroke through friends who had been charged with receiving stolen money. <laughs> 
Given that the police had insufficient evidence against Mr. Pembroke, either at Leatherslade Farm or definitive connection with either of the two gangs, Mr. Butler was prepared to let Mr. Pembroke go. Mr. Williams convinced Mr. Butler to pull Mr. Pembroke in for questioning and in return for releasing him and not charging his friends with more serious crimes, £50,000 was to be returned to Mr. Pembroke and his friends. On the 3rd of December 1963, which happened to be the same day that Roy James was taken into custody, the police received an anonymous tip directing them to the money in the phone box. The money was driven up to Asbury and taken into custody by Detective Superintendent Futrell, who wondered how his London colleagues could know how much money there actually was. Mr Futrell had to bring in bank clerks to count the damp and musty money to determine the final sum. Mr Williams made no admission to the recovery of the money is the result of a deal with Mr Pembroke. Despite claiming that his negotiations were responsible for the return of this money, Mr Williams in his book No Fixed Address in 1973 claimed not to know the identity of the person who had returned the money. Although Mr Williams did mention several robbers to whom he had offered deals through intermediaries. Mr. Williams noted that it seemed to him that Mr. Butler was skeptical of his efforts and that at the press conference, Mr. Hathrell and Mr. Millen did not reveal the circumstances behind the find and that Mr. Williams was never asked to talk with them about it. Despite Mr. Pembroke being the man identified as the assailant of the train driver, Jack Mills, by Bruce Reynolds, Mr. Williams only makes mention of the assailant once in his book. In this section, often quoted by other sources, Mr. Pembroke confirms that with Tommy Butler, he questioned the man they knew to be the assailant, but they had no evidence to convict this man. Strangely, however, Mr. Pembroke makes no further mention of this man. The deal done with Mr. Pembroke caused outrage in the police hierarchy. It is hinted in several books that the deals done by Mr. Williams were responsible for him being overlooked for promotion and that Mr. Williams was unhappy that his efforts were not recognised by his superior, Mr. Butler, but were instead hidden from Mr. Butler's superiors. For his part, George Hathrell, in his book A Detective's Tale, stated that the motive behind the return of the money was not known for certain. Mr. Hathrell said that the money was returned by one about whom extensive inquiries had been made and who in fact was interrogated at length. But in spite of our strong suspicions, nothing could be proved against Mr. Pembroke and so no charge could be brought. My belief is that Mr. Pembroke thought we knew more about him than we did and thinking things were getting hot, Mr. Pembroke decided to get rid of the money to avoid being found in possession with it. Mr. Hathrell does not mention Mr. Williams at all in his book. Mr. Hathrell retired on the last day of the trial at Aylesbury. The 19 gang members who were arrested shortly after the robbery had to spend a large amount of legal fees which was approximately £30,000 each, which was a heavy sum of money for those times. The robbers who spent much time on the run overseas, Mr Reynolds, Mr Wilson and Mr Edwards, had very little left when finally arrested, having had to spend money avoiding capture and indulging in the lavish lifestyles without finding employment. Much of Jimmy White's money was taken from him. According to Marilyn Wisby, her father's share was hidden by his father, Tommy Wisby Sr., in the panels in the doors of his father's home. Mr. Butler raided them three times, but failed to find the train robbery money. The majority of the money was reputedly entrusted to Mr. Wisby's father and also to his younger brother, Ron, who coincidentally had saved some money of his own that was confiscated by the police and returned to Ron three months later after being verified to be legitimate money. By the time Mr. Wisby was released from jail, all of his shares had either been spent or invested. Mr. Marilyn agrees with Piers Paul Reed's assessment of how her father's share was up. Approximately £150,000 was spent. Although Mr. Wisby's share was one that was not taken by other criminals, Marilyn Wisby is still bitter that her relatives got to spend a fair amount of the loot while the overall sum dwindled away. However, Marilyn Wisby's grandfather used some of the money to buy them a house in Upper Norwood. Up to six of the robbers escaped punishment in one way or another. The Ulster Man, three robbers who were never caught, John Daly, who had his charges dismissed at the trial, and Ronnie Biggs, who escaped from jail and managed to avoid being taken back to the United Kingdom. Mr. Daly had entrusted his money to another crook. This man had betrayed Mr. Daly to the police and had absconded with the money. <laughs> 
Upon the release of the others in the mid-1970s, Bill Jennings got in touch with Buster Edwards and Frank Monroe got in touch with the South Coast Raiders. Both said that they had no money left. Danny Pembroke went initially to America and John Daly at the time was said to be living on unemployment benefits in the west of England. Ronnie Biggs quickly spent his share getting a new life. Ronnie Biggs loved his life in Australia, although by the time his family had arrived in 1966, all but £7,000 had been spent. £55,000 had been paid as a package deal to get him out of the UK. The rest had gone on legal fees and expenses to keep him out of jail and living a normal, comfortable life. With all the variations of the proceeds and life of the great train robbery being speculated by many of the train robbers and police, who makes the best case for the truth? Please let us know what you think about the story of the great train robbery of 1963 in the comments below. Thanks for joining us and until next time, stay safe.